and we begin this midday with some breaking news just into our newsroom. Richard Moore, the man on death row, has chosen the firing squad over the electric chair. Moore's April 29th execution would make him the first person executed in the state of South Carolina since 2011. Now, his attorneys have asked the Supreme Court to halt the execution while another court coincides whether the state's capital punishment methods are constitutional. A state law that went into effect last year set electrocution as the default method and added a firing squad option. Moore was born on February 20th, 1965, and grew up in Michigan. He struggled with drug addiction and turned to robbery to support his drug habit. In the 1980s, he was convicted of burglary and weapons charges. In 1991, he moved with his partner, Linda Bird, from Michigan to Spartanburg, South Carolina. The two later had two children together. In 1991, Moore punched Michelle Crowder in the neck while trying to steal her purse in Spartanburg, then kicked her repeatedly in the head and back after she fell on the purse. When Crowder's fiancé came to help her, Moore beat the man so severely that he had to be hospitalized. Crowder would later testify at the sentencing phase of Moore's murder trial. Another Spartanburg resident, Valerie Wisneski, said that Moore robbed her as she was working in a shoe store. In 1997, Moore also pleaded guilty to assault and battery of a high and aggravated nature for attacking a woman. On September 16, 1999, in the early hours, Moore entered Nikki's convenience store in Spartanburg. He was unarmed and was intending to rob the store to support his cocaine addiction. Inside the store was the clerk, 42-year-old James Mahoney, and an eyewitness to the crime, Terry Haddon. As Haddon played on a video poker machine, he saw Moore walk toward the cooler inside the store. He then heard Mahoney shout at Moore and asked him what he was doing. Haddon turned to see Moore and Mahoney in a ball, with Moore holding both of Mahoney's hands with just one of his. Mahoney had pulled a gun on Moore and the two got into a scuffle, with Moore taking hold of the weapon with his other hand. Moore turned his attention to Haddon and pointed the gun at him, telling him not to move. Moore then tried to shoot Haddon, but missed. Haddon fell to the floor, pretending to be dead. Mahoney then pulled out a second gun and several more shots were fired. Mahoney shot Moore in the arm while Moore shot Mahoney in the chest. After Moore paced around the store leaving a trail of blood behind him, he fled the store and drove off in his pickup truck. Haddon then got up and saw Mahoney lying face down on the floor, with a gun lying near his hand. Haddon called the police but Mahoney died minutes later from the gunshot wound to the chest. Moore stole nearly $1,500 from the store. After Moore left the store, Deputy Bobby Rollins, who was on the lookout for him, heard a loud bang as he was patrolling the area. Moore had backed his pickup truck into a telephone pole approximately one and a half miles away from the crime scene. As Rollins approached the vehicle, he saw Moore sitting in the back of the truck bleeding from the gunshot wound to his left arm. As Rollins shouted at him to surrender, Moore confessed to the crime. The stolen money was found in a bag covered in blood in the front seat of the truck. The weapon that Moore had taken from Mahoney was later found on a nearby highway shortly before dawn. Moore was taken to Spartanburg Hospital where he was treated for his injuries. He was then transported to the Spartanburg County Jail where he was charged with armed robbery, assault and battery with intent to kill, and murder. Moore was tried for shooting and killing Mahoney in October 2001. He was charged with murder, assault with intent to kill, armed robbery, and a firearms violation. He was found guilty and the jury convicted him of all counts. In a separate sentencing proceeding, the jury recommended a sentence of death. Moore was then formally sentenced to death for the murder of Mahoney on October 22, 2001. 
Moore claimed he shot Mahoney in self-defense after Mahoney drew the first gun. His supporters and appeals lawyers have argued that the crime he committed was not a death penalty offense. Moore entered the store unarmed and took the gun from Mahoney, with his lawyers arguing that because he did not bring a weapon into the store, he was therefore not intending to kill someone when he walked in. Following Moore's sentence, he was scheduled for execution on January 22, 2002, by Circuit Judge Gary Clary. Prosecutors acknowledged at the time, however, that it would take years of appeals before Moore would actually be executed. After running out of appeals, Moore was scheduled to be executed on December 4, 2020, however, the state was unable to execute him as they did not have the lethal injection drugs required to do so. Moore was given the choice of lethal injection or the electric chair. He declined to pick either meaning he was set to die by the primary method of lethal injection, as the state did not have the drugs available, his execution was stayed. Following this, lawmakers in South Carolina pushed to add the option of execution by firing squad, in an attempt to resume executions, after a failure to get the drugs needed for lethal injection. A bill, approved by a 66 to 43 vote, gave inmates the choice to die by electrocution or firing squad if lethal injection drugs were unavailable. 16. In March 2022, the state announced it had finished developing protocols for executions by firing squad. Moore was scheduled to be executed on April 29, 2022. On April 15, he chose to be executed by firing squad instead of the electric chair. On April 20, the South Carolina Supreme Court halted the execution and issued a temporary stay. I never wanted to have much contact with the men on death row because I knew the day might come when we'd have to do what we had to do. But I had a, a change of heart when the first lethal injection occurred. I knew the young, the young man, his name was Sylvester Adams. Sylvester was retarded, significantly so. He killed his best friend. The victim's mother even appealed to the governor to commute the sentence because he recognized that Sylvester was, really didn't quite know what he was doing. On October 17, 1979, at approximately 3 p.m., Brian Chambers, a 16-year-old with a slight learning disability, was taken from his home and strangled to death in a wooded area directly behind the house. Shortly thereafter, Brian's mother received a phone call. The only words she could make out were, boy, place, money. Brian's mother hung up on the caller not knowing at that time that her son was missing. The evidence introduced at the trial relating to the abduction is as follows. 1. Forced entry into the house through the rear door with the use of a tire tool or jack handle. 2. A piece of tablecloth was torn from the dining room table and used to hold a sock in the victim's mouth. 3. Venetian blind cord, removed from the house, was used to bind his feet once he had been forced into the wooded area behind the house. 4. The strangulation was caused by placing a stick in the tablecloth, pulled down around his neck, and tightening it in the fashion of a tourniquet. 5. A butcher knife was missing from the victim's home and there was a deep cut above one of his ears consistent with a blow from such a knife. James Jeter was a key state's witness. His testimony may be abbreviated as follows. The defendant, Adams, rode a bicycle into Jeter's backyard where he was raking leaves. Adams had a tire tool, a gun and a pair of gloves in his possession. Adams told Jeter he was going to break into the house next door to steal money. After entering the house, Adams attempted to solicit Jeter's aid in removing a safe he had allegedly found there. Jeter refused. Adams then stated he would await Brian's return home from school to get the combination. Jeter spoke with Brian in Brian's front yard when he returned home a few minutes later. He did not warn Brian that Adams was inside because he was afraid. 
A short time later, Jeter saw Adams lead Brian into the woods with something white tied around Brian's neck. He appeared to be resisting Adams. A search for Brian was conducted by Jeter's father and Brian's father, A.C. Mitchell, in the early evening. Jeter became concerned about his friend and asked Adams where he was. Adams told him Brian was tied up in an abandoned house and he would be released when Brian's parents gave him, Adams, some money. He also told Jeter he had attempted a ransom call, but Brian's mother had hung up on him before he could tell her where to deliver the money. Brian's body was found covered with brush by rescue workers the following day. The next day, two days after the killing, Jeter told the police for the first time that he knew about the incident. A.C. Mitchell testified that on the evening of his son's death, when he and a neighbor were searching for Brian with the aid of Brian's small dog, which had been found trapped inside the washing machine of the boy's home, Adams had frightened them away from the area where Brian's body was later found by appearing with his pit bull dog allegedly to aid in the search. An hour before the time, I went back to the, where the, the cell where the inmates were kept. And I asked Sylvester Adams, I said, Sylvester, I just want to know if you know the Lord. He said, yes, sir. A big smile came over his face, a smile. And he said, I sure do. So we talked for a while and I actually prayed with him. And I got ready to leave and he said, Mr. Harvey, would you mind waiting a minute? I said, sure, what's, what can I do for you? He said, would you tell me what's going to happen to me? The kid didn't have a clue as to what was about to happen. He just knew he was going to die. He didn't know how. So I took the time to explain to him that uh, the warden was going to come in. He was going to read a piece of paper that was actually going to be the warrant that gave the authority to carry out capital punishment. And he would have to, he had to do that by law. And after that was done, some officers would come in and they would have a gurney that was about that high and it was on wheels, Sylvester, and they'll roll it in front of your cell. They'll take you out, put you on it, and they'll strap you down. Then they will roll you in to another place. Two men will come out and they will put needles, one in each of your arms. And it won't hurt a lot. It may hurt some. He said, well, what then? He said, well, you will have a chance to speak. The warden will ask you if you have any remarks you'd like to make, and you can do that. And then after that, what happens then? I said, Sylvester, you're going to go to sleep. And when you wake up, you're going to be seeing Jesus. And he looked at me and said, that will be so good. And I'm holding back tears at this point, me, the tough guy in charge. And I said, yes, Sylvester, that will be very, very good. I went back to the command post and we're listening and everything that's going on there. And this young man is singing. Jesus, your baby's coming home. And he sung that over and over and over until he went to sleep. Then he was gone. Difficult days at work. Main reason people cite to have a death penalty is it is a deterrent to murder. The death penalty has never been, is not now, and will never be a deterrent to murder. These people who commit these atrocious crimes don't think, well, I better not do this because I might get the death penalty. They don't think about that an instant. It's, they don't think, period, like we think. So it doesn't, that's not a deterrent. Now what's the other justification for doing it? Well, it is the just punishment for the crime. And that makes sense. I understand that. And in some cases, that is completely true. But here's another problem. For me, it's a fairness problem. There are over 1,000 men and women this very day in the Sacramento Park Corrections serving life without parole for first-degree murder. 
They are walking around in the general population. They have an opportunity to participate in educational programs, to visit with their families in a visiting room. There are 30 some odd, I don't remember the exact number now, men on death row today. They have none of that. They're in their cells basically 23 hours a day, except for showers and that kind of thing. They committed crimes exactly like those thousands of other folks committed. And you would say, oh, well, they weren't near as bad. Yeah, some of them were exactly as bad. But for whatever reasons, they didn't get the death penalty. I don't think it's, I don't think it's fair. So if you ask me today, I know I'm, I'm conservative. Most people who run prisons are conservative. And as I indicated, I'm also pro-life, and I'm now pro-life for all life.